In 1329, Robert the Bruce, the man who had liberated Scotland, died. His final wish was to have his heart buried in the Holy Land, and he entrusted James Douglas, Scotland's greatest commander, to carry it to Jerusalem. Earl Douglas was caught in a battle in Spain and killed, and so the generation that freed Scotland came to an end. But in their place rose new leaders, tumultuous people in a dangerous world. The family of Robert the Bruce's son-in-law, Walter Fitzalan, the first Stuart. Yerhead saw Santa Shron Macharjane. This is a history of Scotland. Scotland is a unique country in that, despite violent and sometimes constant civil wars and dynastic struggles, throughout all of the Middle Ages it retained a single line of kings. The Stuarts rose from French immigrants and petty lords to become kings first of Scotland and eventually the British Empire, but their fate was hardly a certain one. Many of these kings were weak, duplicious, and squabbling. The Stuarts are interesting because they survived and thrived not through the greatness we would expect of kings, but from clever maneuvering, flexibility, endurance, and an absolute ruthlessness. They had a strange ability to produce strength from nothing, balance the delicate cards, and come crashing down at the last moment. The rise of the family itself illustrates the unexceptional, or perhaps highly exceptional, nature of the Stuarts. Although the generation of Bruce, Douglas, and Fitzalan had passed on, the generation to follow was not yet of age. Robert's son, David II, was barely five when he became king, and certainly not ready to rule. Within a year, Edward III and his puppet the young Tabard had returned to Fife and started rebellion in the lowlands. In the case of so young a king, and so dangerous a threat, the stewards of Scotland, responsible for managing the king's affairs, should have taken over. But the heir to Walter Fitzalan, Robert the Stuart, was only eleven. So to protect the kingdom, Thomas Moray, another older cousin, was named first regent of Scotland. In England, where kings generally lived long enough to pass their crown on to strong, young sons, the term regent is rarely used and doesn't convey the power that it held in Scotland. Regents during the Stuarts became almost a dynastic office, wielding power sometimes beyond or at odds with that of the kings. Moray moved out to meet the English army and promptly dropped dead. He was succeeded by yet another cousin, the Earl of Mar, who just as promptly was defeated and killed by the English, who took the ancient seat at Scone and proclaimed Edward Balliol king, taking a huge slice of the lowlands in the process. David II was shipped off to France for safety and essentially surrendered the government. The regency, and the Bruce dynasty, seemed surprisingly luckless. War spread in the lowlands, where Douglas's brother Archibald and Thomas Moray's father Andrew continued to oppose the English settlers. In the north, Robert the Bruce's sister led a barnacled defence in Aberdeenshire, and the fractured government was left in the hands of Bruce's now 17-year-old grandson, Robert Stuart. Where the current regent, Andrew Moray, had been leading a rally of the Scots in the lowlands, up until this point Robert had been concerned mainly with winning back his own lands around Glasgow, and possibly sided with the English before returning to the Scottish fold. But after Andrew Moray became the third regent to die during the war, Robert was given the regency mostly out of desperation. This boy somehow rallied support and within two years had chased the English back across the Firth. In 1341, David returned to Scotland and was crowned by Robert, leading his army southward to invade England. He was promptly defeated and captured by the English, spending the next 12 years a pampered prisoner of Edward III. Robert Stuart was once again left as regent of a kingdom in chaos. By now, Robert Stuart had been fighting the English for almost 20 years, and began to lay out a better plan for the war. Focusing his attention on retaking Scottish lands instead of assaulting English ones, Stuart made gains around Berwick, while the Douglases triumphed over the English at Nisbet Muir. At last, in 1357, Edward III, the great king of England himself, came to terms with Robert and with Scotland. It was hardly that simple, of course. Edward had just hit a setback in the Hundred Years' War, and to fight his battles in France he needed both money and men. Ending the occupation in Scotland would free thousands for his campaigns, and ransoming David would garner more thousands in sterling and gold. Even better, David II had started turning to the English point of view, and could prove a pliable leader. In return for a crippling ransom, the Scots received back a puppet king. 
To his credit, however, David was not entirely a pushover. He resisted attempts to weaken the Scottish crown and expand English influence in the lowlands, but was ultimately hamstrung by the massive ransom being paid for. Too distrusted to restore order, and with the economy spiralling out of control, David entered negotiations again with Edward, arranging in secret that the throne of Scotland would pass to the English upon his death. When he suddenly dropped dead and his dealings were revealed, the Scots rejected the will out of hand. Instead, they turned to the man who had saved Scotland before, the man they considered the true heir of Robert the Bruce. And thus, Robert the Steward, Regent of Scotland, assumed the throne as Robert II, First Stuart King. Despite the importance of this moment, almost nothing changed. The kingdom was still broke, the lowlands were still troubled, and the kingship was still weak. Robert Stuart may have been a good regent in David's absence, but most of his power and success was essentially luck. Robert Stuart became regent, and then became king, mostly because he outlived everyone else. While the Bruces had been liberators of Scotland, the Stuarts were just another among several powerful families, and could never command the respect that the Bruces held. Where David had held together the squabbling nobles through the strength of his father's name, Robert II was unable to stop the growing independence of lords like William Douglas or the clan chiefs like Donald of the Isles. If the Bruce dynasty went up in smoke, the Stuarts were made of little more. In 1384, a group of nobles, led by James Douglas and Robert's own son, John of Carrick, submitted a demand that the king's direct rule be replaced by a council of advisers. They couched their proposal in allusions to David's double dealings and the weakness of the crown, but it was clear what was really being offered. The Douglases wanted total autonomy in their lands, and John of Carrick, as heir apparent, wanted to remove the king and rule himself. Ultimately, they got what he wanted. His father was essentially removed from office, the prince was appointed master of the council, and Douglas was able to begin a private war with the English Percys. All of this backfired spectacularly in 1388, when Douglas was killed at Otterburn, and John was injured by a horse. With his chief lieutenant dead and unable to defend himself, John of Carrick was replaced on the council by his younger brother, and their father's favourite, Robert of Fife. Robert of Fife created the Duke of Albany hereditary head of the council and new steward of Scotland, firmly placing the position in his family and not in the king's. Robert II died two years later, leaving a decrepit John of Carrick to inherit a bankrupt kingdom and much diminished crown of his own making. He became Robert III of Scotland and the Isles, but everyone knew that the Duke of Albany really controlled the kingdom. The stage was set for a new struggle of dynasties, with Stuart regents playing against Stuart kings.